Hey, you can be seated. And Merry Christmas. I'm so glad you're here tonight. I, I, I just pray that God really would bless your family, that would fill you with joy, that uh, as you guys gather and celebrate, that, that peace would fill your household and that you would enjoy health and life and all of God's goodness uh, this year. Uh, I guess in a sense, what I'm really saying is I wish you a Hallmark Christmas movie Merry Christmas. <laughs> right? So before I go any further, how many of you are fans of the Hallmark Christmas movies? Let's see that. Okay, a lot of hands go up. Majority in every service. How many of you have never, ever in your life seen a Hallmark Christmas movie? Yeah, like six hands go up in this whole place. How many of you believe that one of your loved ones need Hallmark Christmas movie therapy, like a support group or something? <laughs> yeah, I feel your pain. I'm there with you on that one. You see, honestly, I got nothing against Hallmark Christmas movies. I, I actually like the Hallmark Christmas movie. Because there's really just one, right? If you've seen one, you've seen them all. Because, you know, they, they, uh, the characters are interchangeable. In fact, they use the same actors. They just change their names and their professions and the name of the town. But have you, have you noticed how unrealistic Hallmark Christmas movies actually are? And I hate to ruin this for anybody, but I just got to point this out. Because uh, it's nothing at all like the biblical story of Christmas. First of all, it's always set in this idyllic, perfect town, Right? It's in the mountains someplace, it's isolated, it's beautiful, and it always snows on Christmas. I don't know about you, but I've never lived someplace that always snowed on Christmas. That, you know, that said, Havasu's never going to be, you know, featured in a Hallmark Christmas movie. <laughs> Unless it's the place you're from, you know, where Grinches live or something, because it never snows here. It couldn't be a Hallmark Christmas movie town. And then all the people in Christmas, uh, the Hallmark Christmas movies have fantastic jobs, right? They're all kind of like independently wealthy and have these incredible jobs, or they're business owners, and they never have to go to work in the movies. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, there's that whole uh, just perfect town. Everybody gets together on Christmas Eve and does a, a town celebration, which I've never seen any place, right? I mean, towns do celebrations for Christmas, but they don't do it on Christmas Eve because where are people on Christmas Eve? They're either in church worshiping or they're with their family celebrating. That's it. You know, people are like, hey, let's go shopping after church, and, you know, then we'll go to the town celebration at midnight with our kids and turn the lights on or something. You know, it just doesn't happen. But then the, the thing that just gets me the most about them is that in the three or four days that a Hallmark Christmas movie takes place in, Everybody in the movie discovers their childhood dreams get fulfilled. They, uh, all their family gets reconciled, and of course, they find true love. Like, that's real life, people. Come on. I mean, I don't know about your family, but that stuff's not happening in my family, especially our extended families. I mean, come on. I mean, a lot of us uh, are going to have a less than idyllic Christmas, right? When you boil it right down to it, some of you are going to leave here tonight, and you're going to go home to an empty house. In fact, it's going to be the first Christmas that you're alone, you know, either through death or divorce, and, and it's going to be tough, and you're here hoping to get some of that joy, but, but you're dreading going home. And, and some of you are, uh, you know, going home, and, and you're praying for that reconciliation with your family because some of you haven't talked to your parents or your kids or your siblings in years or maybe decades. And you want reconciliation to happen, but... You, and, but you don't know how to make it happen. And some of you are wishing you could go home alone because uh, <laughs> your family is showing up tomorrow and, and you're not sure that you can do that, right? Because it's not like the Hallmark Christmas movies where everybody's family gets along or suddenly everything gets reconciled. But, you know, uh, my theory is all families are crazy, so mine's crazy, yours is crazy. Just pray that they're crazy fun, not crazy mean. Uh, but, but honestly, some of you are going to go home and... Um, there's going to be anger and bitterness, and people are going to get nasty, and some of them are going to drink too much, and it's really going to get ugly, and um, you're just praying you don't have to call the cops again for Christmas. <laughs> right? I mean, that's real life. In fact, that's the thing that gets me about Hallmark Christmas movies. They're just not like real life. They're not anything related to the biblical Christmas story except at this one point. There's one point where Hallmark captures the essence of, of the biblical Christmas story, and that is this, that Hallmark movies are filled with liars. Have you guys ever watched these? I mean, I don't watch them on purpose, okay? They're just on in my house all the time from like August till December. And, uh, and so I encounter them a lot. But this is the reason I can't sit on the couch and snuggle with my wife and enjoy a Hallmark Christmas movie. It's because people lie. They lie about their past. They lie about their present. They lie about their job. They lie about their feelings for each other. I'm just sitting there watching it going, can't you people tell the truth? 
No, they can't. Because it's not real. It's nothing at all like the biblical Christmas story. The biblical Christmas story is so different and it's so real. I mean, first of all, that takes place in a town that nobody's excited about. It's not idyllic in any way. It starts in Nazareth, in Galilee, this little backwater place in Galilee. In fact, when Jesus was recruiting disciples, one of his future disciples actually said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Some of you have lived in those towns. You know, they're going to be places from. And, and that's where the Christmas story starts. And, and, and Mary is the, you know, the hero of the story. I mean, there she is, this young woman who's uneducated, doesn't have a fantastic job, doesn't have any money. And God comes to her and says, I want you to be mother of Messiah. And by the way, it'll mean risking your life and your future. And she says, yes. And then what about Joseph, this, you know, the jilted husband-to-be who finds out that his fiancée is pregnant and he knows he's not the dad. And he's done with the whole thing until an angel shows up to him and says, hey, it's okay to take Mary as your wife because the baby is God's son. And he believes the angel and he takes Mary to be his wife. Incredible leap of faith. And then they have to travel to another little town because of the census thing that, that Caesar Augustus has ordered. And they, they get there, and, and they have this inglorious in birth in, in a stable, probably a cave. And who celebrates the birth? I don't know about you guys, but in our family, we had two births this year. It was celebration time and everything. But who celebrates with Mary and Joseph? A bunch of smelly, poor shepherds. I mean, and they show up, and they're talking like they've been, you know, having a group hallucination because they're talking about angels and stuff like this. And, and it's just a crazy story. But it doesn't even end there because you've got this crazy, maniacal king who is the liar in the whole thing. See, the wise men came to Jerusalem. They said, we're here to worship the king of the Jews. And Herod freaks out because he doesn't have any babies. And, and he says, well, I'll tell you what, you guys, you guys go find this baby and you worship him and then tell me where he is so I can come and worship him too. No, Herod wants to kill. He wants to kill Jesus. He wants to kill the baby. He wants to kill the competition. So what ends up happening? Mary and Joseph are told in a dream by an angel to go to Egypt to get out of there. So the, the whole Christmas story biblically ends with this massacre of infants because Herod orders all the male children under the age of two in Bethlehem to be slaughtered. And Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus are refugees in Egypt. That's the real Christmas story. It's not idyllic. It's not perfect. Everything doesn't have a bow on it, a nice happy ending, which is a lot like our lives. Because our lives are not idyllic. And when you leave here, you're going to be walking into, well, hopefully joy and celebration, but some of you going to be walking into heartache and loneliness and depression and struggle and, and families where it's not peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And God understands that. You know why God understands that? Because Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is God in the flesh, and he walked this earth, and so he understands your pain. He understands your brokenness. He understands your despair and your loneliness and your sorrow. He understands betrayal. He also understands pain. He understands assault. He understands death. He understands us. And Jesus came into this world to change our lives, to save our lives from sin, to give us hope, to give us new life, to alter our destinies from hell to heaven. That's why he came. And so if you're here tonight and you're struggling, well, number one, join the club. And number two, realize that God wants to change your life because he's the one who can set you free from addiction. Jesus said, if the son has set you free, you're free indeed. He's the one that can heal your broken family, reconcile relationships, Restore marriages. He's the one who can speak hope into your depression and give you a purpose for life, a reason to get up in the morning and to go on blessing those around you. And ultimately, he's the one who alters our destiny from one of eternal hopelessness and death to one of life eternal. Jesus said this to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. He wants to give you life. 
He wants to change your life. And if you're sitting here and you're going, you know, that sounds really interesting and, and I, I want to believe it and I want to learn more about this, but I, you know, I just don't know. We're okay with that. We're just going to invite you to come and, and join us as we continue worshiping Jesus. Because we're all on a journey of faith and we'd love for you to get to know Jesus and love Jesus and follow Jesus with us. Starting in January, we're going to do a series called Guardrails. Guardrails, it's, it's about how not to crash your life. And, and, uh, and if you want to learn more about the wisdom of God and how he wants to speak into your lives, we encourage you to come and join us at one of our six services in Havasu starting in January. And, and, uh, and if you want to talk with someone about Jesus tonight, you want to declare your faith in baptism like they did tonight, then we want to encourage you to do that. Because here's what we know. Whether you like Hallmark Christmas movies or loathe Hallmark Christmas movies or just don't care, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't have a bit of difference in this world. But Jesus makes a difference in this world. And so we know that whether you're walking out of here into pain or into health, whether you're walking out of here into joy or sorrow, whether you're leaving this place uh, broken or celebrating, what we really wish for you is Jesus, because he is the one and the only one who really can change your life and your destiny. That's what we mean when we say Merry Christmas. Will you pray with me?